On Anzac Day, the word remember is on everyone's lips. But what is it to remember? On remembering. Studies of memory show that a remembered experience has hundreds, if not thousands, of parts. When I remember an experience, it is constructed anew from the ground up. Each time with a slightly different set of parts and in a slightly different order. Every memory I have is not only about a thing or event in the past, but also about the way I choose to remember in the present. Every experience I remember is remembered. The way I remember is mostly shaped by what is going on around me at the time. Context shapes the way I remember. Though I am really deliberate in the way I choose to remember, I can deliberate. I can shape, change and choose the context in which I remember. Today's ceremony is about deliberating on who and how we choose to remember. Welcome everyone to this online Anzac Day service in Mullumbimby, New South Wales. My name is Rose Wainwright and I'm here with John Adicott. We are here to share the role of Master of Ceremonies. I now invite Delta to welcome us to her country, followed by Paul Smith who will respond to the welcome. Kingi wala blagami rako dogun Jandamani nyali garamanyali Nyali nya nyathan nyathan jen garamanyali jugun kunu Wana jangma malakunu gala jugun Nyali nya jugun kunu Bugube blagami Bugube Delta Thank you for that welcome to country Bugube we gather on Anzac Day to remember all Australians who died fighting for their country. There were Australians who died for no other reason than that they were here. From 1788 to 1928, 140 years of frontier war made all Australians, Indigenous and non-Indigenous alike, the people we are today. The first war fought on Australian soil was Pemmelboy's War, 1790 to 1802, a guerrilla campaign waged by Aboriginal Australians, led by their great warrior Pemmelboy against British colonists in Botany Bay, Liverpool, Parramatta and the Hawkesbury River. Other warriors in other parts of Australia led similar campaigns, Mosquito, Port Jackson and later in Hobart, Windradine, central western New South Wales, Yagan, western Australia, Tunaminawait, Cape Grim, Tasmania, Dundali, Moreton Bay, Jandamara, Tunnel Creek, western Australia. There were many, many more. They were Australians who died fighting for their country. After five generations of forgetting and one generation of denial, we cannot say with any credibility, we remember them. Rather, our responsibility for the foreseeable future is not to claim falsely to remember the first Australian patriots, but to unforget them. We unforget them, lest we harbour false memories of who we have been as a people, while honouring those who fell, serving the nation we are still becoming. Thank you, Delta and Paul, for that fine welcome and response. 
1914, we went to war in support of an empire to preserve white Australia. In 2020, we are a multicultural society that supports self-determination wherever it is possible in the world. We gather today to remember who we have been as a people while honouring those who fell serving the nation we are still becoming. I now call upon Alan Morris to give the prologue. We gather here to remember who we have been as a people while honouring those who fell serving the nation we are becoming. A hundred years ago we went to war in support of an empire to defend white Australia. Today we are a multicultural society that supports self-determination wherever it is possible. Clearly our values have changed over time. May the direction of that change never falter. But do ANZAC values change? Every time we have gone to war, men and women have pulled on a uniform to defend the society's values as they were at that time. The constant in ANZAC values is that people put on uniforms knowing it might cost them their lives. While wearing the uniform, four qualities known to every human being come to the fore. Courage, endurance, mateship and sacrifice. The order is important. First comes the courage to join up. Then comes the endurance of knuckling down to discipline and hard work. Then mateship blossoms as a salve of shared pain. Finally, sacrifice. Well, may we say, happy are the peacemakers, because there would be no peace if nobody wore a uniform. Thank you, Alan, for an inspiring prologue. To restate our purpose, we gather today to remember who we have been as people while honouring those who fell, serving the nation we are still becoming. Speaking of remembering who we have been and of the nation we are still becoming is a way of saying that what it means to be Australian is not carved in stone. We are a work in progress. Our values have changed in the 106 years since the outbreak of the Great War. The most significant change is the flourishing inclusiveness of our society. An aspect of that inclusiveness is reconciliation with former enemies. Most notable in that regard is the integration of Turkish immigrants into our multicultural nation, to such an extent that there are Turkish sub-branches of the RSL in Sydney and Melbourne. The roots of reconciliation with Turkish people began on the battlefield just one month after fighting broke out at Gallipoli. During a truce to bury the dead, the diggers and the Mehmet saw one another close up as men rather than as objects of hate. After the war, Mustaf Kemal Atatürk paid tribute to the diggers. Atatürk's words are inscribed in bronze on this cenotaph a gift to us from the Turkish sub-branch in Sydney. I now invite Greg Aitken of the Mullumbimby Drill Hall Theatre to recite the words of Ataturk's tribute. Ataturk tribute. Those heroes that shed their blood and lost their lives you are now lying in the soil of a friendly country. Therefore rest in peace. There is no difference between the Johnnies and the Mamets. 
to us where they lie side by side. Now here, in this country of ours, you, the mothers who sent their sons from far away countries, wipe away your tears. Your sons are now lying in our bosom and are in peace. After having lost their lives on this land, they have become our sons as well. Mustafa Kamel Ataturk, Commanding Officer of the Turkish Forces in Gallipoli, First President of the Republic of Turkey. Thank you, Greg, for that very moving recitation. People and nations often suffer the faults of their virtues. What seems to be a great achievement to some can be a stumbling block for others. That spirit of inclusiveness that has flourished in our society since the Second World War, visible as reconciliation with former enemies at the national level, has driven a widening gap within our society between those who are comfortable with change and those who are suspicious of it. That gap is now so wide that though the Allies won the Second World War, we are now in danger of losing the peace a society so at odds with itself that social unrest and political violence cannot be ruled out. Should that happen, should we lose the peace, those we gather to remember will have died in vain. Remembering the fallen, therefore, cannot merely be about valorising the past. It requires action on our part to secure the future. Please welcome Paul Smith to ponder aloud about what action we might take to ensure that having won the war, we do not lose the peace. I begin by restating the challenge we face. How do we honour those who fought to defend our freedom so that having won the war, we will not lose the peace? Is it enough merely to valorise the past or do we need to be proactive in continuing to maintain the peace? Clearly we must commit to doing whatever it takes because if we lose the peace, those who fell securing it will have died in vain. And we don't want that on our watch. Not losing the peace means focusing on what most threatens peace in our time and finding in ourselves the same courage and commitment to deal with it that the Anzacs took to their fight. It's our turn to be courageous and resourceful and willing to lose what we have for the greater good. But how might we lose the peace? We will lose the peace if we do not put an end to the shouting match between the culpably polarised sections of Australian society. If forced far enough apart, we could create the conditions for civil war, and that would certainly be losing the peace. But it doesn't have to be as total a failure as civil war to lose the peace. On five occasions in the past, Australians have been so deeply divided that rioting has erupted with fatal consequences. And it doesn't even require actual physical violence, but merely the paralysis of the whole society to lose the peace. That kind of failure arises because people in ideological bunkers refuse to talk to each other, refuse to negotiate, holding out for an all or nothing win, despite knowing that an all-or-nothing standoff always ends in nothing for all. Do you feel powerless? Unable to believe that you could make a difference in such circumstances? So let's make this personal. How can I make a difference? 
If I think of the person opposing me not as a cardboard cutout but as a fellow Australian, how can I insist that my opinion is right? This doesn't mean that I should change what I believe, but that I should accept that it's okay for people to hold different beliefs and make different choices. When I accept that people have the right to believe different things and make different choices, I can't have a shouting match with them, and I certainly can't shoot at them, which, let's face it, is what we would do in a civil war. What it comes down to is this. I tell myself, I no longer want you to change when we are disagreeing. I am the one who can change, not by changing what I believe, but by not insisting that you are wrong if you don't believe what I believe. It is then possible for me to talk to people I disagree with, to negotiate, compromise, and achieve together what no one can achieve alone. A whole nation of people talking to one another instead of shouting and sulking. That's where we need to head. Because to do otherwise will be to lose the peace and those who fell securing it will have died in vain. How did we get here? This polarised situation that we're in is due in part to the Allied victory in World War II, paradoxically, and in part to our failure as a people to respond adequately to the opportunity that victory thrust upon us. The Allied victory produced two new political currents that drove far-reaching change in the whole of the Western world, change that was enthusiastically pursued by some but which left others behind, resulting in the polarisation of our society. The first of those currents is our knowledge of and response to the Holocaust. The second is decolonisation and how it changed us. Had the Axis powers won the war, we would never have known what happened in the death camps and decolonisation as we know it would never have happened. But the Allies did win the war and when we found out about the Holocaust, we responded by systematically and comprehensively questioning every assumption and certainty we have ever held and began redefining our values and commitments. The most compelling proof of that is that a century ago we went to war in support of an empire to preserve white Australia. Today we are a multicultural society that supports self-determination wherever it is possible in the world. That is real change in values and commitments. Decolonisation, self-determination, enabled the overwhelming majority of people in the world to seize back their own voices. And that in turn became the opportunity for us in the West to redefine who we are. No longer masters, but partners. More evidence of real change in our values and commitments. Change like this becomes confronting to some people and in this country has led to shouting matches and the polarisation of society into mutually hostile camps. What are those camps? On the one hand, those who are accused of political correctness and on the other, those who feel excluded by the way our society is changing. The situation is the product of victory and failure. The Allied victory gave us the opportunity to transform ourselves, but we failed to do so in a way that was guaranteed to bring the whole country with us. Some of us were impatient for change, others reluctant to change at all. Both sides dug in. The result is the verbal trench warfare of the present day. Who will lead the country out of this? Who has most to lose? 
the veteran community clearly has a great deal to lose. No other section of society is so closely identified with those who sacrificed secured victory for us. No one has greater responsibility than the veteran community to secure the future, to act in the present, to take the initiative. Our interests and concern as a veteran community can't just be about what happened a century ago. It should also be about what we have become as a people since then, how we have both embraced and resisted the opportunity to become a truly inclusive people, a people who remember the cost to all of our good fortune, especially those who fell serving the nation we are still becoming. Anzac Day and Remembrance more broadly could reflect how we who honour the fallen can contribute to the healing of our own society to ensure that those who fell will not have died in vain. What we do as the veteran community, especially on Anzac Day, needs to be rethought in the light of a century of change. If what we do includes an acknowledgement of the change to our values and commitments since 1914, we would be in a position to recognise Australia as a work in progress and to admit that the progress achieved so far is vulnerable to civil sectarianism and disorder. We who honour the fallen might take the lead in reducing civil sectarianism by questioning our certainties and treating those who don't share our convictions as fellow Australians rather than the enemy and hoping for the same from them. We would then be in a position to say that this is what our predecessors gave up their lives for and that by giving up our cherished certainties for the greater good, we are doing what we can to ensure that they did not die in vain. Thank you, Paul, for the call to action to ensure that we do not lose the peace. Even if we chose to be indifferent to the consequences of losing the peace for those who won victory, how reprehensible would it be to remain apathetic about such consequences for our children? Out of the mouths of babes we are being called to account. Children are speaking up in numbers too large to ignore. Please welcome one such child, Byron Hissink, who will address us with a plea, a prayer, the prayer of the children. One hundred years ago, we went to war in support of an empire to preserve white Australia. Today, we are a multicultural society that supports self-determination wherever it is possible in the world. We gather here today to remember who we have been as a people while honouring those who fell, serving the nation we are still becoming. In the name of the children of the world, we pray that you, the adults who hold our futures in your hands will rise above the trite power struggles that hog the headlines and hold politicians to ransom. We pray that you will live by the values you claim to hold dear, a fair go and the rule of law. We pray that you will respect other Australians who disagree with you and question your own certainties before ridiculing people you do not yet understand. We ask this for the sake of those who fought to defend our freedom so that having won the war, we will not lose the peace. Thank you, Byron, for reminding us to live up to the values we profess. There is one word, neighbour, that encompasses commitment to a fair go and the rule of law respecting difference, questioning our own certainties and giving to strangers. Our answer to the question, who is my neighbour, 
is how we know whether or not we will lose the peace. When we are not sure where we stand, words set to music can smelt the heart and forge the will. Sidney Carter's song, When I Needed a Neighbour, usually reflects issues familiar to us from the parable of the Good Samaritan. But the song can be adapted to many situations, as now with the title When They Shouted Hosanna, to reflect the issues of concern here today, such as triumphalism, authoritarianism, and racism. When they shouted Hosanna, were you there? Were you there? When they shouted Hosanna, were you there? And the creed and the colour The symbolism of wreath laying has varied throughout time and across cultures. In the modern era, a wreath is a symbol of everlasting life and growth. The circle is a key feature of the wreath that expresses inclusion, unity and wholeness. Today, as we focus on inclusiveness as the touchstone of our national character, we bring symbols of everlasting life and wholeness to this place which stands in for the graves of all who fell, but especially those whose bodies were never found and given the rites of burial that were due to them.
At this most solemn moment, after the ode is recited, the last post is sounded, followed by an interval of silence which is broken by the ruse. At the last post, the spirits of the fallen are summoned to their cenotaph. The last post also symbolically ends the day, so that the period of silence before the rouse is blown becomes, in effect, a ritualised night vigil. The ode will now be recited by Eddie Ryan, followed by the last post, a minute of silence and the rouse. They shall grow not old, as we that are left grow old. Age shall not weary them, nor the years condemn. At the going down of the sun and in the morning, we will remember them, lest we forget. <laughs> The gravity of the solemn salute is now relieved by the peroration, a speech to inspire enthusiasm among those present. The peroration will be read by Frank Ewer, whose family were prominent as native police officers in the frontier wars. One of his ancestors was killed by the same indigenous people he has written extensively about. Thus Frank has looked both sides of the frontier. Good morning. My name is Frank Ewer. I am an historian 
in the Brisbane area writing about frontier conflicts of the 1840s. Australian veterans are committed to reconciliation with former enemies. Strong bonds have been made with Turkish, Japanese and Vietnamese people in particular. Veterans are constantly being welcomed in friendship by former enemies. Today, you have been welcomed to the country of the Arakwal people of the Bunjalung Nation. This is an offer of friendship that non-Indigenous Australians can fully appreciate when we acknowledge that the first Australians' 140-year struggle to defend their land was the first war that made us the people we are today, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians alike. Reconciliation with former enemies will not be complete until the nation acknowledges the first Australian patriots, the Indigenous people who fell defending their homeland against British colonisation. What might come of recognising the first Australian patriots? There is a myth, much older than the Bible or the epics of Homer, which may help us answer that question. The Mesopotamian epic of Gallimash is in part about friendship a friendship wrought of conflict. The two rivals fought each other to a standstill and then became fast friends, companions. While they fought each other, each cared nothing for the humanity of the other. When each failed to subdue the other, they recognised each other as equals. The only possible relationship between equals is friendship. Or, here are two possibilities. Two people fight, each intending to end the life of the other. They fail, they stop fighting, they become friends. Together, they do what neither could do alone. Or, two people fight, one intending to end the life of the other, the other intending nothing but to preserve his own life, and one fails. By definition, the other has succeeded, but one refuses to acknowledge that there has been a fight and goes about his business as though the other is just not there. Instead of friendship, there is mutual suspicion. Which is it? Can it be otherwise? Why do non-Indigenous Australians still not acknowledge that Aboriginals fought to defend their land? Why are those who fell defending their land not acknowledged as the first Australian patriots? Is it because the way some settlers fought was not honourable and far from glorious and therefore not worthy of being remembered? What would happen if we did acknowledge the first Australian patriots? Would it change the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians? Would suspicion give away to friendship and a truly equal partnership? Would this make a treaty achievable? Does the veteran community hold the key to an honourable settlement to this settlement? If ever there was a situation in Australian society where equality between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians becomes the norm, it is in the military. How hard can it be for non-Indigenous military and ex-service personnel to extend to those who died defending their homelands the same respect they have for their former Turkish, Japanese and Vietnamese enemies? As an eminent Australian said half a century ago, it's time. Thank you very much, Frank, for reprising the acknowledgement of the Frontier Wars, first spoken here on Anzac Day 2018, to general applause and some misgiving as well. A nation founded by people convicted of petty crimes, like stealing bread because they were too poor to feed themselves and their families, will understand the sentiments in this next song in which a condemned man sees and denounces a great injustice. It was on a Friday morning that they took me from the cell And I saw they had a carpenter to crucify as well You can blame it on to Pilate, you can blame it on the Jews You can blame it on the devil, it's God I accuse. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. 
You can blame it on to Adam, you can blame it on to Eve, you can blame it on the apple, but that I can't believe. It was God that made the devil, and the woman, and the man, and there wouldn't be an apple if it wasn't in the plan. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. Now Barabbas was a killer, and they let Barabbas go. But you are being crucified for nothing here below. But God is up in heaven, and he doesn't do a thing. With a million angels watching, and they never move a wing. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. To hell with Jehovah, to the carpenter I said. I wish that a carpenter had made the world instead. Goodbye and good luck to you, our ways will soon divide. Remember me in heaven, the man you hung beside. It's God they ought to crucify instead of you and me. I said to the carpenter, a hanging on the tree. One of the great injustices of colonialism in all eras is the suppression of indigenous languages. Think of the Welsh and Irish languages in the 16th century, long before Aboriginal languages were suppressed in Australia in the 19th and 20th centuries. Today we will hear the Lord's Prayer spoken by Brother Stephen Morelli of Bulgulga in Aboriginal Creole a language devised and used by the Indigenous people all across the north of Australia. Dedi langa hebin, your name in praply haipela, e melabat no more want him anybody gotta use him your name no good bella way. Melabat want him you gotta come on, in jidan boss langa melabat, in melabat want him all the people here Langa every country gotta hear him your word and take notice langa you. Same way like all about doom there langa hebin. Melabat ask him you, blanga gibit melabat daka blanga dagat today. Melabat laram go free, dead lot people who doom but no good balating langa melabat. And melabat ask him you, Blanga laram go melabat free tu. Melabat ask him you, no more blanga laram any jing test him but melabat praply ad bala way. And you no more laram satin take it away melabat prom you. Aboriginal Creole uses English words, but Aboriginal pronunciation and grammar. It has different pronouns if the one spoken to is included or not. WI is pronounced we and means you, the listener, are included. Malabat is we but does not include you, the listener. Thank you, Brother Steve, for blessing us with the sound of Creole. The national anthems of New Zealand and Australia will now be sung by the Musical Island Boys and the Australian Quartet TLA. Archie Roach will then sing Took the Children Away and please stay after that for the Children's Anzac Day Address. Thy 
feet in the bonds of love we meet hear our voices we entreat god defend our free land god pacific triple star from the shafts of strife and war make her praises heard afar god defend new zealand god defend new zealand australians all let us rejoice for we are young and free we've golden soil and wealth Toil, our home is good by sea. Our land abounds in nature's gifts of beauty, rich and rare. In history's page, let every stage advance Australia fair. strains then let us sing Advance Australia, Australia Fair This story's right This story's true I would not tell like the promise said they did not keep And how they fenced us in like sheep Said to us, come take care of him Set us up on mission land Told us to read, to write and pray Then they took the children away Took the children away the children away Snatched from their mother's breast Said this is for the best Took them away Welfare and the Holy Spirit Said you've got to understand We'll give to them What you can't give Teach them how to really live Teach them how to live their self Humiliated them instead Taught them that and taught them this And others taught them prejudice You took the children away The children away Breaking our mother's heart Caring us all about Took them away One dark day on friendly hand Came and didn't give a damn My mother cried Go get their dad He came running Fighting me Mother's tears were falling down that shaped up and stood his ground He said, you touch my kids and you find me Then they took us from a family Took us away They took us away Snatched from our mother's breast Said this is for the best Took us away Told us what 
Good morning, girls and boys. I have a question for you. Do you think there are lessons we should learn from war? One answer is yes, we should learn to be better at it and to do what it takes never to lose. We don't want to lose, do we? No, and we don't want to be there for the wrong reasons either. So, is there another answer to the question, are there lessons we should learn from war? Yes, we should learn how to ensure that having won the war, we do not lose the peace. Lose the peace? What on earth could that mean? I'll tell you. Australia was on the side that won the First World War a hundred years ago. But little over a year later, we lost the peace. We lost the peace by being unfair to the side that lost the war. We made Germany take all the blame and we made the German people pay. And that made Germany run out of money and paved the way for a man called Adolf Hitler to take over and lead his country and the rest of the world back into war again. That's how we lost the peace. Thankfully, our side won that war too. And this time, we learned from our mistakes. Instead of making the losing side pay, the winners poured money into Germany and Japan so that they could take their place in the world again. And that made the world a more fair place than it ever been before. In other words, we learn to take responsibility rather than to lay blame, and we learned not to be greedy. Now, do you think we might be forgetting those lessons? Do you see political leaders behaving like bullies and cheats and blaming others for things they do themselves? Do you see countries forgetting to share what they have with people who've lost everything? If so, what can we do about it? How can we ensure that, having won the war, we do not lose the peace again? 
Firstly, we can find better ways to take responsibility for problems rather than blame others. Secondly, we can make sure there are more people to build a better world by sharing what we have with others rather than building fences around it. Now, you may be wondering, how can you make a difference? After all, you're not in charge. You don't even vote yet. Let me remind you how you are already making Australia fair, the kind of country that will not lose the peace. When someone becomes a bully in the playground, you take the side of the person being picked on, don't you? And you show the bully how to play fair. You help the bully and the person being picked on to fit in properly with everyone else. When someone cheats in the classroom, you don't pretend not to notice, do you? You tell the cheat in private to stop it. And if the cheat doesn't stop it, then you tell the teacher. And you know that having tried to do something about it yourself first, you're not dobbing. When you become teenagers, you'll continue to do what your parents tell you, but like every generation of teenagers before you, If it ever seems they're being unfair, you'll push back. In so doing, you'll be learning the skills you need to hold all people in authority to account. But you're not teenagers yet, so what about now? How can you get the adult world to see what it is doing to hurt your future. You can't make them do what you want, but you can plead. You can say, please. Think about the things that you see adults doing that make you go, duh, and say, please, please, why are you hurting my future in this way? I'm not going to say what I think might be hurting your future. You see the news when it's on in your house. You hear adults talking about what's going on in the world. You know what you think is hurting your future. But will adults listen? Let me tell you, adults will listen. We have a saying out of the mouths of children. So I make these three recommendations to you as things that you can do to make Australia fair, to make it the kind of country that will never lose the peace again. Deal with bullies. Call out cheats. And think about how your future is being hurt by grown-ups and plead with us to be better people. Can you do that? Go in peace to love and serve your neighbours and the world. Please welcome Frank Constable to read the Prayer of the Children. We gather here today to remember who we have been as people, while honouring those who fell, serving the nation we are still becoming. In the name of the children of the world, we pray that you, the adults who hold our future in your hands, will pray that you will live by the values and you claim your hold, and dear, a fair go, you and the rules of law, we pray that you will respect other Australians. We ask this in for the sake of those who forgot to define our freedom. And so having won the war, we do not lose peace. Thank you, Frank. 
May you grow up in a world in which grown ups are grown up and will never lose the peace. Thank you all for tuning into this Anzac Day service for Mullumbimby, New South Wales. Go in peace to love and serve your neighbours and the world.